Welcome to the OR Today webinar series. We're excited to have over 150 pre-registered attendees for today's webinar. The second annual OR Today Live Surgical Conference will be held next month, August 28th to the 30th in Chicago, Illinois. All of our educational sessions presented at OR Today Live meet the CE requirements for the CSSM certification exam. In total, over 22 CE contact hours are being offered at this year's conference. We will award an OR Today Live tote bag to the first attendee who can answer the following questions. How many years has it been since the Chicago Cubs won the World Series? Use the questions feature on your webinar dashboard to answer now. While you are answering, I want to remind you Today's webinar is eligible for one continuing education credit. To obtain your certificate, you must complete the post-webinar survey, which will appear immediately on your computer screen at the end of today's call. If you do not receive the survey, please email us at webinar at mdpublishing.com. All right. The winner of our OR Today Live tote bag is... Jeff Hill. Congratulations, Jeff. The correct answer is 107 years. Registration is open for the OR Today Live conference, and early bird discounts and details are available online at ortodaylive.com. OR Today would like to thank our sponsor, Encompass Group. Encompass Group is one of the leading manufacturers and marketers of reusable textiles, professional apparel, disposable and single-use medical products. Encompass Group believes that every patient, resident, caregiver, and family member should feel safe and comfortable in today's healthcare environment. Markets served include acute care, long-term, senior care, retail healthcare apparel, hospitality, and government operations. For more information, visit encompassgroup.net. Our presenter today is Angie O'Connor. Angie is an RN and former periop nurse with experience in device sales and education. Angie, you may begin whenever you are ready. Thank you very much and welcome everyone. Um, thanks for joining us for the third course in our Mind the Gap series entitled Mind the Gap, Utilizing Evidence-Based Outcome Evaluation to Simplify Patient Warming. Our first two courses have been presented at the annual AORN surgical conferences for the past three years. And this course was actually introduced this year in Anaheim. The previous Mind the Gap courses established the gap with patient warming protocols for the emerging outpatient population. We also explained the benefits of pre-warming, reviewed the impact of cutaneous heat loss, and discuss patient-focused warming strategies. This module was developed to further understand how evidence-based outcome evaluations can help simplify patient warming and bridge the gap between what we know and what we're actually doing in our facilities today. In the recent AORN First Look Periop Briefing, that discusses the new 2016 AORN guidelines for the pre prevention of unplanned patient hypothermia, author Kelly Putnam explains that the new guideline does not recommend one method over the other. We're always looking for definitive answers as we seek to deliver the best possible care to our patients. Unfortunately, we're not getting a clear recommendation when it comes to maintaining normal thermia and patient warming. So we need a way to determine which method or methods are best suited for our individual patient populations. In today's webinar, I'm going to provide you with useful information to help you develop a more specific plan of care for your patients. We're going to discuss the evolving patient outpatient surgical population and the continuing prevalence of hypothermia in spite of all of our efforts to date. We're going to understand the role of the perioperative team 
collectively in maintaining normal thermia. We'll examine typical warming methods in use today, define evidence-based nursing, develop an evidence-based outcome evaluation process, and lastly, use the evidence-based outcome evaluation process to simplify patient warming in your periop areas. So as you're all aware, and based on recent data, the outpatient surgical population continues to grow and now represents approximately 65 million procedures annually, or 88% of all surgical procedures. We also know that this is a very fast-paced environment, and we need to make every minute count when these patients are uh, floating through our uh, departments for procedures. Over the past three years, I've spent a great deal of time consulting in the OR. And in my travels, I find that patients are rarely being pre-warmed prior to being transported back to the operating room. The reason for this varies, but nonetheless, it's on rare occasion that we actually see that patients are being pre-warmed. According to Roth, without pre-warming, there may not be enough time for intraoperative active warming to be fully effective, again, because they're moving through at such a rapid pace. So delivering patients to the operating room in a normal thermic state assures a great start to maintaining normal thermia throughout the patient's periop experience. Early implementation of reflecting war reflective warming, for example, is a simple way to improve patient comfort and effectively bank their own heat to prevent unplanned hypothermia. And we're going to touch on this in more detail as we move through the presentation. As I said earlier, in spite of all of our efforts in response to the SCIP INF-10 initiative, Unplanned hypothermia remains a significant concern for patients undergoing surgery, even for those that are using active warming today. According to the recent AORN annual report, 74 million surgical procedures were performed in the United States in 2013. A 2015 study of more than 58,000 surgical patients at the Cleveland Clinic revealed that despite the use of forced air warming, 64% of the patients were hypothermic 45 minutes after induction. So this is a very clear picture that we're still uh, battling to maintain normal thermia in the operating room. Knowing this, we can see that a one-size-fits-all approach has not accomplished our goal of maintaining normal thermia. So today, I really encourage you as we go through this presentation to challenge your existing protocols and evaluate your patient population to determine the best method or combination of methods for patient warming based on their individual needs. So in the next few slides, I'm going to focus on the patient's perioperative journey and ways we can help maintain normal thermia. All areas and disciplines share the responsibility to achieve our goal of maintaining normal thermia. Pre-op, intra-op, and PACU staff must work collectively to take responsibility for maintaining normal thermia. We often see it as an anesthesia function or responsibility, but we all share the responsibility to take measures to assure a normal thermic outcome. In my observations, establishing an interdepartmental plan for maintaining normal thermia offers the greatest opportunity for improvement in this area. Preoperatively, the goal is to have the patient stay warm, start warm, and the preoperative team are tasked with patient comfort maintaining normal thermia and pre-warming to bank the heat, along with numerous other activities before the patient leaves for their procedure. However, often due to the temperature of the waiting area or the pre-op area, the patient's temperatures are rapidly declining before they ever get to the OR. We admit them to the department 
take away their clothing, start IVs, often infusing cold or room temperature fluids, and quickly the patient's temperatures begin to fall. This doesn't take into account delays either, which add to the extended exposures to a cold environment. At this point, many patients are well on their way to a hypothermic event. The slide above demonstrates how reflective warming products can be used to pre-warm patients. This modality warms the skin surface and reduces cutaneous heat loss as soon as the product is placed on the patient. In this study, Leo Lelleveld, CRNA at Erasmus Medical Center in the Netherlands, demonstrated the benefit of pre-warming patients with reflective gowns. Patients in the subject group successfully maintained normal thermia, while the control group experienced a significant decline in temperature, and more than half required active warming to reestablish normal thermia. So it's important to remember that if we can maintain the patient's temperature throughout the perioperative experience, it's far more beneficial to their experience and less likely that more aggressive warming measures will be needed to return them to a normal thermic range. Once the patient moves to the intraoperative area, the primary responsibility of the team relative to patient warming is to protect the patient by maximizing surface coverage to prevent heat loss. According to the Cleveland Clinic Center for Continuing Education, roughly 90% of metabolic heat is lost through the skin surface. In this slide here, we're going to focus on the rule of nines, which divides the body's skin surface into sections, each with a value relative to the total body surface area. This guide can be a valuable resource in determining how to optimize skin surface coverage during various types of procedures. One of my greatest aha moments relative to patient warming in the OR has been the environmental factors that contribute to hypothermia for our patients. Some operating rooms, as you all very well know, are now being kept at temperatures in the mid to upper 50s or low 60s. Patients are moved into the rooms, gowns and blankets are removed for positioning and preps, and cutaneous heat loss rapid, rapidly takes hold. Then we add to this induction. So with anesthesia, the warm core blood is being cooled off as it mixes with the cold peripheral blood. Cold IV and perhaps irrigation solutions are being utilized. And you're really left to wonder, how can we possibly keep these patients warm? Well, let's talk through that with a few examples using this chart from the Rule of Nines. So I'm going to start with your Cysto or GYN patients, and they're typically in stirrups for their procedure. So you can see by looking at this slide that each leg is assigned a value of 9% for the front and back with a total value of 18% per leg. So when we have them up in those stirrups, we have a total value of 36% of the cutaneous heat loss with the legs alone. It's not uncommon to see warm bath blankets or an upper body warming device being used on the upper body and arms. Often though, you'll see that the lower abdomen and pelvic region is not covered. Part of it may be included in the prep but also there still are areas above there that are exposed and not being covered. So this really provides additional opportunity for heat to be lost. The patient is, of course, covered by the drapes, and I often hear people say to me that, well, we have drapes covering those areas, so it really shouldn't matter. It's important to note, though, that drapes do not prevent cutaneous heat loss. So in this example, you can see how quickly a patient can lose its heat. When we combine that then with general anesthesia, as I mentioned earlier, heat loss through the cold OR table, a cold room, and possibly infusing with cold IV and or irrigation fluids, we have a recipe for hypothermia. So the key here is a collective approach, and that can create an environment for normal thermia to prevail. 
So in addition, in addition, excuse me, to patient warming modalities, this may also include things that look like adjusting room temperatures. I met a, a surgeon late this last fall, a general surgeon who's now beginning to make a, a requirement that his operating room is set at 70 degrees for all of his cases. And he said it's been very beneficial in helping to prevent uh, heat loss in hypothermia. Fluid warmers are also very important, particularly when we look at starting them right up front with cold IV solutions. And also only exposing the patient's skin when and where necessary and covering them back up as soon as possible after we've uh, done the prep, got them positioned, et cetera. So the next example I'm going to walk through is a basic abdominal procedure. Depending on the type and length of the procedure, I most often observe the use of an active warming device on the upper body, as mentioned for the previous case, covering the chest, neck, and arms, and then typically warm bath blankets, if anything, are covering the legs or the lower part of the body. As we discussed in the previous example, with the legs and pelvic region exposed, there's an opportunity for 36 to 40 percent or more of the cutaneous heat to be lost. I also didn't mention the heat loss from the head, and we talk about that. I think people are well aware of, of that, but there's an entire 9% that we can contribute to the head. So if we add that as well to this mix, we can see that there's opportunity for great heat loss with abdominal procedures. So to prevent this, we need to cover as much of the patient's body as possible with a proven warming modality or a combination of modalities that will prevent additional cutaneous heat loss. For abdominal procedure, procedures, excuse me, it's easy to see um, why we need to use these corrective modalities and combine them with these other uh, environmental factors. So maximizing the exposure of the patient's skin during transfer to the OR table, during the skin prep, and during transfer to the gurney for PACU warming our solutions again, and then also possibly focusing on can we possibly adjust some of these room temperatures to make a difference for our patients. The updated AORN guidelines for prevention of unplanned patient hypothermia identifies considerations for selecting a warm method, which warming method, excuse me, which includes the planned procedure, so just like we talked about, what is that procedure, what will the patient positioning be, and then warming equipment constraints that could limit access to the surgical site and or the skin surface area contact. Again, keeping in mind that we want to cover as much of the skin surface as possible. The guideline also goes on to say that the collective evidence suggests that using a combination of methods for patient warming may be the most effective approach. So you can see how we can pull a number of factors together in treatment modalities to make a, a real uh, positive impact on our patients as they pass through the department. In the PACU, the team is responsible for the continuation of care that includes monitoring, preserving heat, and preparing the patient for discharge. We all know that shivering is a common complication postoperatively. According to the research of Bach and Mosch, after general anesthesia, shivering is a common complication in both normal thermic and hypothermic patients. Non-thermal regulatory shivering can indicate post-op pain or residual concentrations of volatile anesthetics producing spinal hyperreflexia. Post-anesthetic shivering mainly contributes to patient discomfort and to morbidity by increasing oxygen demand and elevating intraocular or possibly even intracranial pressure. Knowing, though, the underlying cause of the shivering really is essential to determining the proper course of treatment. I challenge everyone to ask the question, if the patient is normal thermic, is there really a need for additional methods of warming to be implemented? Again, in my experience, we're all creatures of habits, and most often the staff automatically will take multiple blankets from the warmer 
and apply them to the patient. And this includes all areas, pre-op, intra-op, and PACU, or they'll have them on hand. We'll often see several blankets stacked on the bed or the gurney just in case. Excessive utilization, though, of warm blankets can quickly add unnecessary costs to every case performed in the periop suite. And over a year, this cost can really be significant, and we're going to touch on this just a little bit later. So now we're going to look at some common warming methods. We know that each patient should be evaluated for the warming strategy that best meets their individual needs throughout their experience. So getting back to cotton bath blankets, they can provide a sense of security and comfort to the periop patient and the staff as well as I just alluded to. However, it's important to know that the benefits of warm blankets are relatively short-lived. It's estimated that they only retain that heat for about six to eight minutes. And this is where we really see an opportunity for excessive utilization of warm bath blankets in the operating room. There's also another question that surrounds uh, the bath blankets, and that is introducing lint into the environment. According to Moss et al., warming blankets can potentially produce lint. In their 2015 article entitled Sterile Lint and Fibers in the OR, what's the big deal? They state that in today's dynamic healthcare environment, it's more important than ever to take effective steps to reduce the lint. I don't know how many of you have had the opportunity to read this article, but I would strongly encourage you to pick it up and um, read it thoroughly. It outlines multiple sources of lint or particulate matter that can become airborne and result in significant complications for our patients. So again, it's very informative, and I would really encourage you to pick this up. The next warming method is active warming. And as we all know, it's one of the most common measures being used uh, intraoperatively today. However, according to Roth, it's difficult to demonstrate an increase in core temperature from our active warming te techniques, such as forced air warming, until at least 30 minutes have elapsed. So again, getting back to our outpatient facilities or outpatient areas being very fast paced, there's some questions around can we actually measure the effectiveness in the short period of time that these patients are passing through our department. Additionally, when upper body forced air blankets are used as the only method of intra-op warming, as I mentioned before in these previous cases, the majority of the skin remains exposed and unprotected. So we need to look at that rule of nines example and be sure that we're covering as much as possible. Next, reflective warming products combine the function of traditional linen with intrinsic warming and insulating properties to start working immediately and can complement active warming for longer procedures when used as an adjunct to active warming. In a 2015 research project at the University of Tennessee Medical Center, Edie Patterson and Robert Heidel compared active and reflective warming methods. In their study, they found that each intervention used to maintain normal thermia was proven to be equally effective in preventing hypothermia. So they're saying that both of those methods and their experience uh, were equally effective, and so that's important information for us to take note of. So next we're going to focus a little bit on evidence-based nursing. And we know that nurses are the front line of patient care, and you spend the greatest amount of time with the patient and have the opportunity to transform the quality of health care through evidence-based nursing. Kathleen Stevens states in her 2013 manuscript that the impact of evidence-based practice has echoed across nursing practice, education, and science. The call for evidence-based quality improvement and healthcare transformation underscores the need for redesigning care that is effective, safe, and efficient. 
Then the Honor Society of Nursing, Sigma Theta Tau International, defines evidence-based nursing as an integration of the best evidence available, nursing expertise, and the values and preferences of the individuals, families, and communities who are served. They go on to say that this approach to nursing can bridge the gap between the best evidence available and the most appropriate nursing care of individuals, groups, and populations with varied needs. So given the significant shift to outpatient surgical procedures that we're now experiencing, now really is the time to evaluate our current warming methods using this approach. So next I'm going to share with you a four-step excuse me, a four-step evidence-based model to compare reflective warming, cotton blankets, and forced air warming to maintain normal thermia in the outpatient surgery department. So in this um, first step, we're going to develop a clear clinical question. The PICO model that's shown here was introduced in 1995 by Richard Richardson et al. who wrote, what makes a clinical question well built? Well first, he says that the question should be direct, directly relevant to the problem at hand. Next, the question should be phrased to facilitate searching for a precise answer. So to achieve these aims, the question must be focused and well articulated for all four parts of its anatomy, which is the PICO model demonstrated here. So the P stands for the patient or problem being addressed. The I stands for the intervention or exposure being considered. C is the comparison intervention or exposure when relevant. And then the O would be the clinical outcomes of interest. So for our example today of considering reflective warming as an alternative to cotton blankets and active warming, the P or the population will be outpatient surgery. The intervention will be cotton bath blankets and active warming. The comparison intervention will be reflective warming and the outcome will be normal thermia. The second step in our process is to collect and review evidence to support our initiative. Today, evidence is available from a broad range of resources as shown here in this slide. Recent studies, though, indicate an average of 17 years is needed, wow, 17 years, before new knowledge generated through research, such as randomized clinical trials, is incorporated into widespread clinical practice. And even then, the application of the knowledge is very uneven. The interpretation can vary from person to person, region to region, or institution to institution. Non-research evidence, as pictured here at levels four and five, can often be very valuable in justifying the evaluation of an alternative intervention in the absence or delayed availability of more complex studies. So AORN includes the following types of evidence in this category. Here we see their clinical practice guidelines, literature reviews, expert opinion, case reports, organizational experience is very important, the community standard, and then clinician expertise. So step three is the, in um, the process is to use the evidence-based based approach, excuse me, to compare interventions collect the data, and measure the outcomes. Establishing measurable data points is key to the success of any study design. And in this situation, I cannot emphasize enough the need to clearly define what information is needed, the importance of educating the data collectors or the staff on the process and putting measures in place to assure consistency in data collection before starting an evaluation. Neglecting these steps can result in inconsistent and inconclusive findings after investing significant amounts of staff hours required to do an evaluation. Taking the time up front will help assure that you have valuable data to support your decision-making process. 
Once you have selected your data points, standardized tools like the clinical evaluation form and the data collection tool shown here can help streamline data collection and ensure consistency. The inclusion of both control and subject patients are required to provide an unbiased representation for analysis. The control patient data will reflect current processes and outcomes, and the subject data will provide supportive data or information to compare outcomes for alternative modalities and a basis for comparison. And I always find um, doing these studies, it's very interesting and I think enlightening. Um, we all are performing tasks every day that we know that we're supposed to do in our particular areas to get our patients safely through their procedure. But it's not often that we might be quantifying this information and really sitting down and taking a look at what we're doing and what the outcomes are. So this process can be very, very helpful for the overall department to, to look at what we're currently doing. In this example, you would collect data for each patient using a clinical evaluation form, and that information would then be recorded in a combined tool determine the outcome evaluation. So the final step of the process is the evidence-based outcome evaluation, or EBOE. The evidence-based nursing guide from the University of Massachusetts Medical School explains outcome evaluation attempts to interpret the results and evaluate the outcomes of the applied evidence or intervention. The simplest way to present your findings is in a summary like the one pictured here. Remember, the summary should include a comparison of all key data points for the control and the subject groups and clearly communicate outcomes for each. It highlights the efforts of the PERIOP team and their contribution to the process. This can help drive implementation of improved protocols and encourages the entire team to be a part of the solution. I know that staff are extremely busy getting their patients through the process. However, I'm not sure that they're aware of the collective impact of cutaneous heat loss and the environmental factors that are impacting every patient that goes through the department. Creating a protocol for the prevention of hypothermia that identifies specific guidelines for pre-op, intra-op, and the PACU, and educating staff on the key role that they collectively play in this process will encourage collaboration toward the common goal or outcome of maintaining normal thermia throughout the patient's perioperative experience. I'm absolutely confident that everyone has a deep desire to keep their patients warm. So in summary, evidence-based practice, which encompasses evidence-based nursing and the use of an evidence-based outcome evaluation process, helps us determine patient-focused strategies to improve outcomes for unplanned hypothermia in our perioperative patients. According to American Nursing Today, evidence-based practice is about translating the evidence and applying it to clinical decision-making. The purpose of evidence-based practice is to use the best evidence available to make patients, excuse me, patient care decisions. Most of the best evidence stems from research, but evidence-based practice goes beyond research use and includes clinical expertise as well as patient preferences and values. The use of evidence-based practice takes into consideration that sometimes the best evidence is that of opinion leaders and experts, even though no definitive knowledge from research results exists. Research is about developing new knowledge. Evidence-based practice involves innovation by finding and translating the best evidence into clinical practice. So with that said, that concludes my presentation today. I'd like to thank each and every one of you for joining us today, and I think we're going to turn this over now or open the floor up for questions, so thank you. Okay, thank you, Angie. The first question is, 
do you believe that pre-warming patients and maintaining normothermia throughout the patient's perioperative peri experience impacts the patient's outcomes? Well, what I do know is that pre-warming the patient or the absence of pre-warming the patient can really start a cascade of events that drives that patient toward uh, a hypothermic experience. Um, if they start off, as I mentioned, I, I have had experiences where um, they're waiting, as I mentioned before, in a cold waiting area, and sometimes if cases are delayed, they may be out there for a good period of time, so they're already chilly when they come back into the pre-op area. Then we do what we do to them to get them ready. That adds to that cutaneous heat loss, and so once that cascade starts uh, to go into play, it can be a challenge, particularly um, as these cases move quickly to get them back up to normal thermia by the time they get to the PACU. So I do think it's important to try to have them warm right from the start and keep them warm throughout. Okay, question number two. Who should be responsible for keeping our patients within the norm normothermic range? You know, based on my experience and observations, there are a lot of factors that, that fall into this range. And as I mentioned before, we think of it as being an anesthesia responsibility, but in each area, um, we play a role. So um, although that final responsibility may be for anesthesia and delivering the patient to the PACU normal thermic, if we keep them warm preoperatively, if we uh, pre-warm them, for example, if we perhaps start their IV fluids um, that are warm as opposed to room temperature. When we get to the back, there are a lot of things that take place for this patient where, as I said, we transfer them onto the gurney. Um, we anesthetize them. The blankets come off. The gown comes off. We prep them. They're exposed to the evaporation effect of skin preps, et cetera. Um, all of these things, uh, you know, play a part in contributing to cutaneous heat loss. So I personally believe that it's the responsibility of each and every member in each area to be aware of what we can do to minimize cutaneous heat loss, and then as a department come up with a plan that really meets the needs of the patient and focuses on preventing that cutaneous heat loss. Okay, thank you. How can the uh, periop team create an inter interdepartmental strategy to keep our patients normothermic throughout their perioperative experience? Well, I think my recommendation um, right off the top of my head, um, knowing what we know about the rule of nines, for example, might be to have observers from each department um, pre-op, intra-op, and PACU to perhaps follow uh, a series of patients and based on procedure type as well and how they're positioned, follow those patients through the periop experience to see where those exposures are taking place. Take note of what your room temperatures are in each location. Look at how um, you know the patient is perhaps exposed in various areas. Um, a lot of times they'll go from pre-op to a holding area where perhaps epidurals or spinals are started and we'll be exposing their entire back. So even there, any warming that we may have done or maintaining them in pre-op, then once they get into a holding area, that can all sort of go out the window. So my best suggestion would be to create a team with members from each area and follow those patients through and look for those opportunities to improve that cutaneous heat loss and then come up with a plan that is communicated throughout for the staff to follow. Okay, as a follow-up question, could you explain the rule of nine that you mentioned? Yes, um, the rule of nine is a slide that was in the presentation that actually divides the body's um, surface area into quadrants, if you will, or each area is defined uh, in 9% of the body parts, if you will. And so 
So what that rule of nine chart explains or shows is the opportunity for cutaneous heat loss if those areas are exposed and not covered at any given time throughout the patient's experience. So we can use that really as a tool to help us to plan and see if we have a patient up in stirrups and they're losing just from their legs 36% of their body heat or their cutaneous heat through their legs alone, that gives us the opportunity to look for options to um, you know, be able to cover that up and prevent that cutaneous heat loss. Okay. Have you seen any literature or evidence as to effect on surgical site infection reduction with warming rates? Well, I can only uh, refer to the AORN uh, guideline that came out, and I think that the literature on that is mixed, but there is a lot of discussion around um, the, you know, the hypothermic patient in surgical site infections or wound healing rates. Um, the best thing that I can do to refer to that is really just think about cold patients and how we get vasoconstriction, and so that reduces the circulation and blood flow into those areas. And uh, so you'll see a mixed bag, and I would just refer you to the guideline that AORN has revised recently, and you can see a variety of uh, studies that are listed there pertaining to that topic. Thank you, Angie, and thank you again to today's sponsors in Compass Group. One lucky attendee today will win lunch for their department. Details are included in the post-webinar survey, which will appear on your screen shortly. You must complete the survey to obtain your, your certificate. If you do not see the survey, then email us at webinar at mdpublishing.com.